Hey boys and girls, meteorologist Steve Caprata here back with Caps Corner Summer Camp episode number four. Now today we're talking about another one of the really we important weather tools we have. Those are satellites. Last week we talked about radar. Today we're going to talk about satellites, how they work, the different types, some examples, and I'm even going to give you a look at a cool experiment that uh, gives you a little bit uh, about how we use one type of satellite. Now the main type of satellite that we use on a daily basis it's called a geostationary satellite. These things are way up out in space, 22,000 miles up above us. They fly directly over the equator, but most importantly, as you look at this little animation, they orbit at the same rate that the Earth uh, orbits or spins. They move around, and what that does is it keeps it over the same place on Earth at all times. That's real important because it allows us to string images or pictures together. We can make movies or animations because it stays over the same part of Earth at all times. So those are our geostationary satellites. Another type that we use sometimes, these are called polar orbiting satellites. These fly at a much lower altitude, much closer to Earth, anywhere from about 100 to 600 miles up above us. Still way up there in the sky, but not nearly as high as the geostationary. These only hit the same spot on Earth about two times a day because they're flying over the poles like this. So it's a different, we can't really string the images together and make a seamless movie or animation. They do though, because they're close to the Earth, they give us a higher resolution, a clearer picture a lot of times. And uh, it's most typical for these to take a, make an orbit in less than two hours. So they're moving along quickly. Let's talk about the origins, the beginnings of weather satellites. Our first weather satellite was called Tiros one it's created by a company called RCA. Moms and dads will remember RCA. A lot of us grew up with electronics that were made by RCA, but it was launched in 1960. So if you do a little bit of math, it's about 61 years ago that we had our first weather satellite up in space. It had two TV cameras on it, two video recorders, and that was about it. It only lasted up in space 78 days, less than three months. That would be a failure by today's standards, but Back then, it was a huge achievement being our first satellite that we ever had for observing weather from out in space. And here's the type of imagery we got from that satellite. Kind of hard to make it out, right? But still, this was a big advancement. Now, let's see how things have advanced through time. Hurricane Betsy was a really bad hurricane in 1965 that hit Louisiana. Here's what uh, a weather satellite image of Betsy looked like. You can't really make out the eye. You can kind of make out a blob of clouds, but that's about it. So still kind of blurry, right? We advance it now to 1969, Hurricane Camille. This was another really powerful hurricane. This was a Category 5. We'll talk more about hurricane categories in next week's uh, lesson, but as strong as they get. Uh, so here it is moving into the Gulf of Mexico. At least we can start to make out the eye. This one also hit Louisiana, parts of Louisiana, and went into Mississippi. So gradually through time, things are getting better, but look at what we've seen in more modern times. This is what Hurricane Katrina looked like in 2005. So for the boys and girls watching, most of you too young to remember this, this was also a Category 5 at this point in time. It weakened a little bit before it came into Louisiana, but one of the worst hurricanes on record, uh, not only hit Louisiana, but really any part of the United States. Now, in even more recent years, we get stuff like this. This was 2017. We can make sure of these 3D satellite images. This was Hurricane Maria. This one did a lot of damage in Puerto Rico, but boy, just amazing the amount of detail we get on these, right? Here's a look at Hurricane Dorian in 2019. With this, we're getting a new image every minute and we can look right into the eye of the storm and we can get a lot of detail. So you see how these satellites just continue to get better and better through time. Another view of Hurricane Dorian, one of those flashes. Well, not only now can we see the clouds, our latest satellite can even detect lightning within storms. So we continue to do more and more with our weather satellites. Another type of weather satellite that we use actually kind of gives us a different advantage. It could kind of see down through the clouds. Most of our satellites can't. This is what we call a microwave satellite image. And this almost kind of looks like what you might 
expect to see out of a radar loop or a radar image, if you remember back to last week's radar lesson. But this actually is penetrating through the clouds and giving us a look at Hurricane Dorian in a different way. And that can really help us see what the inside of the storm is doing. So it's an important uh, type of satellite that we use now as well. So our most recent weather satellites are GOES-16 and GOES-17. Talk a little bit about GOES-16, which kind of covers our part of the world. It's got a lot of uses. Not only does it show us clouds, which weather satellites have done for a long, long time, it can focus on fog. It can give us a look at wildfires. It can look at vegetation, volcanoes, aerosols, things like pollutants that are up in the atmosphere, ozone. So it does a lot more than just look at the clouds. It has that lightning sensor on it that I just showed you a couple of images ago with Hurricane Dorian and GO-16. This is the best resolution, the clearest pictures that we've ever gotten out of weather satellites. And we also get those images more frequently than we ever before. As I said, sometimes we can get a new image every single minute. And it wasn't that long ago. We used to get a new satellite image maybe every hour. Now when they put it in a certain mode, we can get one every single minute. Now let's talk about the different types of satellite images. This is an example of what we call visible satellite. Now visible satellite relies on reflected sunlight. So if it needs sunlight, what does that mean? Well, it means we can't use it at nighttime because there's no sunlight, right? So visible, uh, visible satellite's pretty cool, but it's only available during the day. Uh, one thing with visible satellite though, it can be kind of tough to tell the difference between low clouds, kind of close to the ground. Clouds are about midway up in the atmosphere and are high level clouds, so that's one of the weaknesses that we have with it. Here's another type. This is called water vapor. Now when we look at a water vapor image like this, it's technically not really showing us clouds. The water vapor satellite is actually detecting the water vapor in the atmosphere. If you're with me for the very first lesson we did, uh, we went over the water cycle a little bit in the first and second ones, I think it was. We talked about water vapors. Anybody remember what water vapor is? That's water that's in the form of a gas. It's invisible all around us. Well, that's kind of what the satellite is actually seeing. Now, we look at a water vapor image. This is actually more focused a little higher up in the atmosphere, in the mid and high levels of the atmosphere. So that's kind of good for tracking our big storm systems, what we call our upper air disturbances. What's an upper air disturbance? Well, just kind of think of that as uh, a little area in the atmosphere where things are a little unstable that might lead to clouds and rainfall and storms. Uh, these water vapor images are also good for finding areas of drier air. So on this image, see this orange right here on the right side? That's where we've got some drier air in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere. Another real important type of satellite is called infrared. Now very simply, what it does is infrared senses energy as heat. And I'm going to show you an experiment on that in just a moment to explain a little more. But one big advantage, if we compare, say, infrared to visible, Remember, visible satellite needs what? Reflected sunlight, right? Well, infrared, we can use this day, night, 24 hours a day. So the images are always available. But one thing uh, with infrared, it can be a little bit difficult to distinguish between low clouds and fog and sometimes the ground. And uh, that gets a little complicated, but sometimes because this is essentially detecting temperatures, uh, the ground, Fog and low clouds can all have very similar temperatures, and so the satellite can have a tough time telling the difference when we're trying to use it um, uh, to detect those different things. So now, let's, let's talk a little bit about sensing heat energy. I'm gonna bring this home for you. We're gonna do a cool experiment. I'm gonna take you back into my home lab now, and we're gonna build what's called a solar updraft tower, and I'm gonna show you heat energy in action. Hey boys and girls, back in our home lab now. We were just talking about in our satellite lesson how infrared satellite senses heat energy in the atmosphere. Uh, so we're going to uh, show you how you can see heat energy in action with the simple little experiment. So, got my two assistants here today. Hi, I'm Eliana. Hi, I'm Claire. Eliana and Claire are back with me today. 
Here's what you're gonna need. We're gonna need three tin cans. Eliana, hold those up and let me grab one from you. So we gotta make sure that uh, the bottom and the top are cut out of these. Now for moms and dads, you're gonna have to help with this. And for moms and dads, well, they'll tell you, you might have to look around the store a little bit. A lot of the tin cans have rounded bottoms where the can openers don't really work. So make sure you get a can that's got a flat top and a flat bottom. We're gonna need some tape. So I've got some painter's tape. Uh, we're gonna need a couple of push pins. I've got a couple of those here. You guys show them the pinwheel that you guys made. Can you show them that? So what we did, you can find little printable templates online for these uh, pinwheels. I'll uh, include a link to this on the website, but you can Google it. Uh, just look for a printable pinwheel and then you can make your own. And the last thing we need is like a piece of wire. Can you hold up the little piece of wire that you have? You see it, Clara? So I made these off of a wire hanger we had in the house. Maybe a little piece of wire should do this. I said that was the last thing. We have one more thing we need. We need two books. We actually need two books for each, but we have a couple of the Ginger Z weather books that Eliana loves to read. So now we're gonna go ahead and tape our tin cans together. both our sets of three tin cans all taped together now so the next thing we're going to do is take our little piece of wire and we're going to tape it on the top of the can right here all right so now we got our little handle taped on both of them the next thing we're going to do is take these little push pins and mom and dad might have to do this part, but you're gonna tape it right on the top. And what that's gonna do is that's where your pinwheel is gonna attach. All right, so we got our push pin on the top of each one of these now. The last thing we're gonna do is attach our little pinwheel. So Eliana, I think you're gonna try to do that, but again, mom and dad might have to help with this part. If you're worried about your kid uh, poking their fingers. So uh, there we go. Once we get it all the way on there, it should kind of spin, but I'm gonna show you more about that in a minute. Clary, my daddy to help you with that. We got it on there pretty good. All right, so with that, the next step in this is gonna be to try to find a windowsill in your house to get some sun, because we want these things to heat up, okay? So that's where we're gonna go next. We're gonna take these to the window. So this is an experiment that might take a little bit of patience depending on whether you've got a good sunny day or not. Now, if it's sunny and there's no wind outside, you can try it outside, but the idea is if there's any wind, it's gonna make your pinwheel spin and you're not getting the real idea of what's happening. But what's making that pinwheel spin if you got it working? Well, that's those cans as they get hot, they then transfer some of that heat to the air on the inside and the hot air starts rising up and making the pinwheel spin. The whole idea, we were talking about infrared satellite and heat energy, how the satellite uses that. I wanted you to see some of that heat energy in action, and this is a way you can see it. Even though we can't really see the heat energy, you can see that something is happening, that warm air is rising up and making the pinwheel spin. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Let me know if you have any luck with it. Thanks for watching. Bye. 
All right, boys and girls back in studio now. I hope you enjoyed that experiment and maybe you'll get the chance to make your own your own solar updraft tower. Pretty cool to see that heat energy in action, right? Let's get back to some other things that we can see with our weather satellites. When it comes to be hurricane season like it is right now, not only can some of our satellites give us a look at water temperatures, which are really important with hurricanes, they can even show us where the warm water is especially deep. And that's really important with hurricanes because we know if everything is just right in the atmosphere and a hurricane's moving over not only some warm water, but where that warm water is really deep, that can make the hurricane stronger. And that happened with Hurricane Katrina in 2005. I showed you a satellite image of that one earlier. You see the red here? This was a satellite product showing us what's called the loop current. Now the loop current is basically just a current that has some really deep warm water. And as Katrina moved over that loop current, that's where it got to be its strongest. So that's another thing that satellite can help us with. It can do things like this. Uh, back in uh, April of last year, we had a really powerful EF4 tornado that moved through uh, Mississippi. And this is the satellite kind of looking at vegetation. But focus in here. We start out with the before image and then watch. Can you make out that narrow little line? That's the path of the tornado where it took down trees and kind of scoured out the vegetation. So pretty remarkable the things that we can see from space. Another thing we can see is the Mississippi River especially carries a lot of sediment. So let's kind of think of it as little small pieces of dirt. Um, it carries a lot of sediment. Now down here in South Louisiana, we have levees around the Mississippi River, which keep it contained. But before we built those levees, people built those levees, before we built those, the Mississippi River used to flood on a regular basis. And as it would flood, some of that sediment would get deposited. And that would help build new land here in South Louisiana. Well now, because of our levees, that sediment just gets channeled all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico. But here's satellite picking up. You see kind of the milky shade down here. That's the mouth of the Mississippi River. We can see some in Lake Pontchartrain because what's called the Bonnicary Spillway was open. That's allowing water to flow from the Mississippi River into the lake and down around the mouth of the Atchafalaya River. We can also pick up on some of that sediment. So that's something else we can see uh, with satellite. Here's some other things. We can look at volcanoes. Now remember, I told you GO-16 can actually detect some sort of like gases and aerosols. So this was a volcano erupting down around Indonesia. And uh, as this loops back, you see that right there? That's actually the satellite uh, detecting sulfur dioxide, something that is emitted into the atmosphere when volcanoes erupt. Here's another way of looking at uh, volcanoes. They're really hot, right? And what comes out of them? All that lava and magma. So this one is uh, detecting the heat, uh, that little red spot. That's the magma that's come out of the volcano. And then here's another way we can use sort of the infrared satellite that I talked about to detect where all that hot lava is. So there's uh, kind of yellow pink shades. That's where the lava is. This is Mount Kilauea in Hawaii back in 2018. So we can track volcanoes with our weather satellites. We can see stuff like this. Back in 2017, we had a pretty big solar eclipse that much of the country got to see. Watch this. Can you see the black spot moving across the country? That's the shadow. That is the moon passing between the sun and the earth, casting a shadow down on earth. And that's what we saw as the solar eclipse was happening. So this is our visible satellite. And so as the sun gets blocked, we get that black spot that shows up on the visible satellite. We can see these things. You see these clouds that are in uh, neat little rows over South Louisiana? We call these cloud streets. Now, typically they're kind of associated with just kind of uh, relatively quiet weather, nothing major, but they're still pretty neat to see on satellite. Here's another look at these cloud streets, a really cool example of these moving from southwest to northeast, if you know your directions. I know it's hard to make out, but that's South Louisiana also underneath those clouds. We can see some pretty neat details. Uh, back in 2008, we had a pretty big snow event here in South Louisiana, and this is after the snow fell, 
where you see the white stuff, that's the snow that was left on the ground the next day. Why can we see that? Well, snow reflects sunlight better than the ground does, and so it's brighter and it shows up more easily. So everywhere you see the white, that's where snow was on the ground the next day. That was a pretty big snow event too. We had three inches of snow at the airport in Baton Rouge, Zachary five and a half inches, but up to eight inches of snow in a meet. That was a pretty big event. We had another pretty big snowfall event that maybe uh, some of you remember in 2017. Here's once again satellite showing us where the snow came down from Louisiana and then Mississippi, Alabama, up into Georgia. All that white stuff, that's not clouds. That is snow cover uh, the day uh, after it all came down. We can look at wildfires with satellites. This was a really big wildfire in California back in 2018, but can you see the smoke streaming out of that big wildfire? That can be real important, especially out in the western United States. And that same wildfire using a different sensor on GO-16, that satellite I talked about, we can see where the fire has burned the ground and left a scar in the vegetation, burned away all the vegetation where you kind of see that brownish shade and you can see what an impact that had. Uh, back in uh, 2010, I think it was, uh, the Deepwater Horizon, there was an oil rig that had an explosion offshore of Louisiana and then a lot of oil leaked out into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, if you make out that milky shade kind of at the beginning, uh, in the middle of the image, I should say, that milky shade, that's the oil slick out there in the Gulf of Mexico. We can also detect oil rig fires like this one in 2013. That little yellow spot, that's a satellite picking up on a hot spot telling us, uh-oh, we've got some trouble. We can see things like this. Our visible satellite, these little holes, those are called hole punch clouds. And then can you see this? straight line. This is called a dish trail, a dissipation trail. All of those things are actually caused by aircraft, by airplanes moving through the clouds. Now here's what a hole punch cloud looks like down at ground level. Pretty cool, right? Uh, we talked a little bit about this in, in our cloud lesson, but if you, uh, uh, if you look at uh, this picture, an, a plane has flown through the layer of clouds punched a hole in it, and then the cloud kind of starts to form and fill back in. That's called a hole punch cloud. We can see fog. Now look at this. We can see some stuff moving in this satellite movie, this satellite loop. Those are our clouds, but if you look, you see kind of some white and gray that's not moving much. That's how we know it's fog. When it's not really moving a whole lot, then we know it's fog and not clouds. We can also see these. These are called contrails. Now you might have to look a little more closely, but these straight lines, those are condensation trails. Those are produced by the exhaust from jet airplanes. So here's what a contrail looks like in person, or these actually several contrails, but down at ground level. So these are actually kind of clouds that are produced by planes and aircraft. We can see dust. We get a lot of dust coming off of West Africa, the Sahara Desert. So here it is, the milky shade out over the Atlantic. This can be important in hurricane season because it can really limit tropical systems from developing if there's too much of it. And here's one more animation or loop of some of that dust coming off of the Sahara Desert out into the Atlantic Ocean. So yet another thing we can track with satellites. And I've got uh, one last thing to show you. Have you ever heard of the Northern Lights or the Aurora Borealis? We can even track that on satellite. Um, the green stuff here, that is the Aurora showing up on one of our satellites. So pretty neat, uh, all the different things that we can see. So I just wanted to show you guys, A, a little bit about whether satellites are really important, B, how they work, and C, just all the different stuff we can see with them. And those were just some of the examples. There is a lot, lot more. All right, so we're now through lesson number four. Those were weather satellites. We've got four to go coming up next week. We're gonna get into hurricanes. I think that's gonna interest a lot of you boys and girls. And after that, we'll talk about tracking hurricanes, tornadoes, and how meteorologists like me make a forecast. But that's all I've got today, so we'll go ahead. If you're watching on Facebook Live or on YouTube, we'll take your questions, pop them in the comments, and I'll be happy to take them. 
All right, welcome back everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed that lesson about weather satellites. Um, hard to believe we're already halfway home here in Caps Corner for the summer. Four of our eight lessons are now down. So again, just to reiterate, if you have any questions, go ahead and pop them in the comments on Facebook. And for those of you watching on YouTube, you can pop them in there as well. And I'll uh, try to answer any questions uh, we might have. So let me take a peek around. Uh, as you heard at the end, we'll be talking about hurricanes next week. Uh, if you're watching this live on Monday morning, June 28th, something you can watch this recorded, but if you're watching it live as of 10 o'clock, we do have a new tropical depression that uh, just developed. Uh, it's off the coast of South Carolina, tropical depression number four, not going to be a threat to South Louisiana. It could become tropical storm Danny later today or tonight before it makes landfall more than likely in South Carolina. So hurricane season off to another quick start this year and we continue to track some systems out there today. All right, so let's take a peek and see if uh, you guys have any questions. All right, so we've got Miguel and Donna and Linda and Desmond, Jessica, Shamika, Donald, Jean, uh, Damian, Kim, all in here, Samantha. Uh, so appreciate you guys watching. Not seeing many questions roll in. One thing I forgot to mention, uh, on our little uh, solar updraft towers. If you are going to try that at home, you know, mention using the books. What were those all about? If you were watching closely, you saw those come into action. I didn't explain that very well though. Uh, so you need to set those towers on a couple of books or something like a couple of books. But most importantly, you want to raise those towers up a little bit off of whatever surface they're on and make sure there's a bit of a gap underneath that can because we want air flowing in from the bottom. It's not going to work um, if we don't have a way for air. So if you put that uh, tower straight down on the book uh, where there's no airflow from the bottom, it's not going to work. So why we took two books is kind of balance the can with a space in between the books where air could flow up from the bottom. Um, so that was one important thing I forgot to mention as we went through that experiment. All right, so just taking a peek down again to make sure. All right, let's see. It looks like we might have a question here. Zane, uh, what type of vegetation are you talking about? Uh, that's a good question. Now, I, I'm going to openly admit, and this is really important, boys and girls. Uh, it's good to know what you, good to admit what you know, what you don't know, your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, but when we talk about satellites kind of detecting vegetation, I don't fully understand everything that's involved there. Um, but usually when we talk about vegetation on satellites, a lot of uh, what we look at is kind of a change in greenery. Um, so we saw that uh, come in a, a couple examples of that that, that uh, I showed you. Number one, do you remember the tornado scar uh, that was in Mississippi? So we went from the satellite kind of sensing really kind of almost a solid green to where we had the path of the tornado, a little narrow line where that green went to brown. And that's where the trees were removed or the tops were kind of taken off by the tornado. And then the other example we saw was out in California, the big wildfire. Again, the, the before image was all green, uh, but after the fire, there was a big area that had turned brown where everything had burned, and that was the scar from the fire, but it's a good question. There's so much, you know, uh, you saw, I, I ran through a lot and there's still a lot more I could have shown you uh, boys and girls, but there's so much that we can detect now uh, on uh, satellites. All right, now it looks like uh, Zane may have another question. Uh, what is the most important satellite? That's a good one, that's a tough one because as it kind of went through, uh, they all have their strengths and weaknesses, right? I really like to look at visible satellite, the one that relies on sunlight. Um, that's the one where we can often kind of see the most detail, but when it comes to be nighttime, and really even before the sun sets, once the sun kind of gets low on the horizon, both in the evening and in the morning, uh, we still don't really have a good look at the clouds. The sun has to get high enough up to where that sunlight is reflecting off the cloud tops and we start to get a good look at it. So. Um, you know, I don't know that you can necessarily say one is the most important, but I would say visible is probably my favorite um, just because of the, the level of detail. You can really see some neat features on the visible satellite sometimes. All right, let's see if we've got anything else rolling in before we wrap this up. 
Lorraine is saying good morning, watching with her daughter. Well, good morning to both of you guys. Um, the other thing is uh, this lesson will be posted on the website, wap.com slash caps corner. You can also watch the recorded version on YouTube, on Facebook. Uh, if you go to the website though, uh, we'll also have, as I've been doing every week, uh, three different worksheets that go along with the lesson. So something you can print and the kids can do. I do have the answer keys. Hopefully you wait until you give it a try. I try not to make these too, too hard, uh, but some of the questions might be a little challenging. And uh, we're also gonna try to post a link um, if you're gonna do the solar updraft towers. Uh, one of the things that you need for that uh, is the pinwheel, right? So me and my girls, we actually made those off a little printable template. Now. Uh, we recorded that yesterday. Um, I tried to look at the store. I was thinking a little bit of a hack on that. If you don't want to go through the trouble of actually printing and kind of folding and taping and all that, some kids might find it fun, some not so much. Um, I was trying to find one of those just little pinwheels you can often find like a dollar store or something like that that just sits on a plastic stick and spins. You could easily just take the pinwheel off of that and then use that at the top or if you have something like that at the house, instead of having to make the pinwheel from a template or from a piece of paper, you could certainly do it that way. But I'd love to hear if you can make that work. A little tricky right now with the weather pattern we're in because it's so, it's so cloudy so often and uh, just so rainy. You really do need some good direct sunlight to get that working, but if you do give it a try and get it working, uh, let me know. All right, it looks like we may be done with the questions at this point. We'll take one more look. Yes, I'm not, uh, all right, not seeing anything else uh, rolling in. So with that, again, thanks for watching. We've got four more lessons to go next week. Uh, one that I think will get a lot of attention. That's our lesson. We'll talk all about hurricanes. Same time and place. It'll be Monday morning at 10 o'clock on Facebook, on WAV Plus, and on YouTube. So hope to see you then. In the meantime, try to stay dry with all this rainy weather.